The part of the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution that we'll be discussing this week guarantees that you shall not be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against yourself. The historical origins of this right run deep into British and European history, going back at least to the Inquisition, when many were forced to change their religion or face torture and death. There are, however, other, more modern theoretical reasons that ground the right against self-incrimination. One is simple procedural fairness. For there to be a fair and competitive trial against an individual, there has to be this basic notion of non-self-incrimination. Another is rooted in the nature of adversarial criminal justice itself. Here the idea is that the state or government's job is to investigate, arrest, gather evidence, and prosecute you without your help. The burden of proof, therefore, is on the prosecution, and it needs to do the heavy lifting when it seeks to take your life or property. A more practical concern, though, which explains much of the origins and development of the cases we're reading in this section, stems from racially charged trials in the South during the 1920s and 1930s. In these cases, individual confessions were often brutally beaten out of innocent black suspects. In overturning these cases, the court in the 1930s and 40s held to a bare minimum understanding of the self-incrimination right. Beating a confession out of you violated that right, but the court didn't go much past that. It was not until the Warren Court began its foray into the criminal procedure provisions of the Bill of Rights in the 1960s that the Fifth Amendment self-incrimination clause took on a new and controversial life that we're still dealing with today. The Warren Court moved from ensuring statements to police were adequate and reliable, free of coercion, to creating a set of deterrent or prophylactic rules to protect the right. Moved by revelations about the common use of coercive interrogation, beatings and torture, that were widespread throughout many police departments, the court decided that there needed to be a set of first-line procedures for supervising police interrogation and preventing bad confessions. The interrogation room was necessarily secret, and judges could only guess what went on. During the Miranda cases, for example, the court referred to police manuals which detailed how police could use the, quote, third degree to elicit confessions. Moreover, the court was bothered that so many convictions were the result solely of confessions, lacking even a rudimentary investigation and gathering of evidence. To fix this, in 1966, the court in Miranda v. Arizona laid out the now famous Miranda warnings that police would now have to use in most situations. The Miranda rules are famous. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you. Do you understand these rights? Ideally then, this recitation will ensure that even the simplest man or woman would know that he or she had a right to remain silent. The Miranda decision was controversial from the get-go. Police felt handcuffed by the new rules. Because so many convictions did indeed rely on the confession, arguments abounded that the guilty will go free. Controversy would continue. When do the Miranda rights kick in? When someone is in custody, yes, for the most part, but not always. Some of the cases we're reading in this section bring out these fine distinctions of the actual application of Miranda in the real world and the dangerous and serious situations that police face every day. The court is still largely supportive of Miranda, but many conservative justices have argued that its procedural nature means that it shouldn't be seen as a right in and of itself. As a result, at times the court has ruled that the actual Miranda statement need not be read verbatim. More recently, the court has even ruled that to avail yourself of the right to remain silent, you have to affirmatively invoke that right, creating a potentially uncomfortable situation where to remain silent, you need to speak. As you read these cases, think about the following issues. How necessary is the Miranda warning to protecting self-incrimination? Do you think Miranda is a right like other enumerated rights, or simply a procedural device? Should Miranda be read at any point in your dealings with law enforcement, or only when you're arrested? Should a violation of Miranda result in throwing out your confession? 
These are hard questions and hard cases to read and think about, but they form the current basis for one of your most fundamental rights.